Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the avatar of the gods and got harem. Part 1. Huge shout out to Neon Zanjetsu for this story. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Immortality is a funny thing, some might think it a gift from the gods themselves. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live forever? To never age. Never die. Would not one call that a blessing? Ha. Huh. More like a curse. For what else can this be? To watch your friends grow old, while you yourself remain young. Letting them move on with their lives, start families of their own grow old. To stand there helpless as they wither and die, as you lay those flowers upon each their graves knowing, knowing you were powerless to defeat time itself. The one enemy even I could not hope to defeat. But I digress. I'm sure you're wondering who I am. I have seen and done much in my time, and I'm not necessarily proud of it all. I have helped nations rise and fall. Civilizations have crumbled in less than an hour at my hand. Fought the war to end all wars. Witnessed the end of the shinobi. Traveled to distant lands. I have loved and I have lost, outliving each and every one of my wives and children, helpless to do anything but weep. My tales are many, and my exploits great. I have carved my name into the elemental nations as they were once known a hundredfold, and still I am unsatisfied. I am the last of the dying breed, doomed to reincarnate time and time again until I fulfilled my purpose. I cannot age but I can die. If one wishes to know the pain of a spear through their heart, or the painful end of decapitation, you need only ask me. My deaths are many, my lives, seemingly infinite. Now, as this century-old war rages in this land, once again, I feel compelled to act, if not for myself, then for the needs of others. I swear, I am such a masochist, always throwing myself into the fire for others. What irony. Immortality is indeed a funny and fickle thing, ain't it folks? Which is how I come to find myself here, in this distant place, in the oddest of situations. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto, avatar of the gods. And this is my story. Wet. Naruto was not a fan of water in general. Oh, he drank the stuff of course. He even swam, whenever the whim struck him. But he did not, by any means, enjoy being doused from head to toe. Especially not this early in the morning. Certainly not when he'd elected to accompany two rambunctious children out here in pursuit of fish. It didn't help when one of said children didn't want his help. But their grandmother had been unusually adamant this morning. So here he was, the tribe's last remaining man, babysitting. Honestly, he was getting too old for this. He might be physically trapped at the age of 16, yet that didn't make it any less ridiculous. These people had taken him in, offered him food, and shelter starvation was one of the worst ways to off himself not to mention furs when there were virtually none to be found. Perhaps that was why he stayed. He felt he owed these people. And by definition, their children. Including, much to their occasional consternation as well as his own Sokka and Katara. A moment ago he'd been laughing when she'd accidentally doused her brother with water in an attempt to catch a fish. Then she had gone and gotten him wet. Now, Naruto was no stranger to the cold, but he was not enjoying the sensation. Not in the least. His sole satisfaction was that he'd managed to catch said fish before it could escape back into the seat. He made for quite a sight, his crystal blue eyes shadowed by sopping wet bangs, his lips quirked downward in a slight frown, gloved mitten clenching tight their hard-earned dinner. Katara. Sorry. Oh, you will be. Naruto grinned and shook himself like a wet dog, spattering her with droplets. Take this. Hey. His grin grew another inch. One good turn deserves another way. He nimbly dodged aside when she flung a small wave at him in retaliation, thus dousing Sokka even further. The small torrent violently tore the boy's spear from his grasp, just before he could successfully skewer his first fish sending his precious weapon arsing end over end, before finally sinking to the water below. Within seconds it was gone, plummeting to the depths and out of sight. A small cry of surprise left his lips, that gobsamaked expression was simply too good to pass up, both teens burst into laughter. Will the two of you please stop playing your little weather games? They're not games, Sokka. Katara admonished. There. Right right, an ancient art indigenous to our tribe. Naruto began to tune their bickering out as the canoe drifted through the ice pack. Southern water tribe or not, the girl had a remarkable amount of spirit. Admirable. She would have made a fine shinobi, back in the elemental nations. The whole bending concept was entirely beyond him, but that didn't mean he was lacking in understanding. These people utilized their kai in the same way he wielded chakra. Bending wasn't all that uncommon, neither was it rare, either. He'd been utterly amazed by the sheer ingenuity of some benders when he'd first come here perhaps amazed hadn't been quite the right word. Dazzled, perhaps. His first visit since his arrival a century before had been to the Fire Nation, he'd marveled at their destructive art of the Inferno, reminding him so much of the Achiha with their self-righteous arrogance. 
Then, the Earth Kingdom with their grand yet stoic simplicity, and the reclusive yet light-haired air nomads, he'd spent many months creating new jutsu just by witnessing their uncanny manipulation of air currents. Finally, it was to the Water Tribe which he'd found himself drawn. The war had broken out shortly thereafter. He'd been in the process of evacuating civilians when the Fire Nation killed him. It had taken an entire armada and nearly a thousand men to do the deed. He'd only been reborn about a handful of years ago in the same place he perished. Cold. Naked. Alone. The up reincarnation was a bitch and a half. And apparently he wasn't the only one trapped in this wretched cycle of rebirth. There was this supposed figure. The Avatar. A master of all four elements, Mayanto preserved peace between the four nations. If so, then where the devil was he? Naruto had never met the man, but anyone doomed to be reborn over and over again had to be one hell of a cynic. He'd only died a handful of times, and each time had been more painful than the last. If the Avatar had gone through the same thing, then he might meet a man. Surely the man hadn't just been hiding out for the last century had he? No. Of course not. No one was that much of a coward. Not even him. Nevertheless, a certain degree of caution had to be exercised whenever utilizing his own abilities. Couldn't have everyone thinking he was the Avatar now, could he? Even waterwalking, as he was doing now, drew a fair amount of attention from those not acquainted with it. If he were to bust out his dejutsu or any of the techniques he'd gained from absorbing the juubi during in the war, he'd probably have half the nation trying to kiss his feet, or worse, if the Fire Nation found out. Not that all of them were bad, there was that Iroh fellow, but regardless, he wasn't exactly eager to be hunted down again. He might not be an avatar of the elements, but he was certainly an avatar of something else. Look out. The blonde jerked his head upwards, drawn from his reverie just in time to witness the inexplicable, for all intensive purposes, appeared to be an iceberg rising from the depths of the ocean in their path. And they were hurtling towards it. The subtle exertion of Shinra Tensei prevented Sokka and Katara from dashing their canoe against this great glacier, but only just, they were still flung from the boat before he could think to stop them sent sprawling head over heels in a hilarious tumble of arms and legs. You kids okay? The Tara mumbled something, Sokka's exclamation was a great deal less reserved. What's that? Naruto eyed it warily, this frozen sphere that stood before them. Was that a kid in there? Unthinking, he chopped down. Hard. Pia. The icy cage split and twined before the savage chop, releasing a great geyser of steam. And light. Did he mention light? Scarce had his gloved hand touched the eerie orb than a beam of light burst into existence, hurtling upward and into the heavens. A frightening cynic boom shook their surroundings, shattering the fragile canoe shattering beneath the sudden onslaught of air and sound. Naruto hissed. Not out of fear or awe, or even his own sense of self-preservation, but the knowledge that anyone for miles around would be able to see this. Anyone. Including any Fire Nation vessels. Oh crap. Meanwhile. Leagues away, Prince Zuko saw it. And how could he not? Rocketing into the heavens like an arrow loosed from a bow, the great pillar of light dominated his vision, demanding his awe, his attention his everything. He could feel it calling out to him like a clarion call, the return of his honor merely a few miles to the north. A single thought dominated his mind, turning his scarred face intent with fury. It did not matter to him when it cut off abruptly, he already knew his heading. Knew what did await him there, not just the fight of his life, but the chance to finally, at long last, return home. At long last, I've found him. That which his father, grandfather, and even his great-grandfather had been unable to find. The Avatar. But the brisk stride he stalked past his guards and into the bowels of the ship, dutifully ignoring his uncle when he asked to join him for tea. Zuko did not have time for tea. Not when his destiny awaited. Perhaps had he lingered he might have noticed Iroh's light smile in passing. Might have heard his words. But as it stood Zuko did not listen, instead, he stormed into the cabin and issued a fateful order that would forever reshape his life in ways he had yet to foresee. Unknowing of this, he still gave the order. Helmsman, head for the light. Naruto, what are you doing? exclaimed Sokka as the blonde extricated his palm from what had, mere moments before, been a sphere of ice. No longer. The second that beam of light had gone up, the former shinobi had all but attacked the sphere, shredding it to pieces with his bare hands, until the light finally dissipated. Now that it had, he'd slowed his assault. The Tara could see that his gloves were gone, burned away by the intensities of his strikes, reduced now to little more than rags wrapping his hands. Bedding him out. The blonde shook his still numbed hands in a vain effort to warm them. Ain't that obvious Ara, it looks like we've been beaten to the punch. Both boys turned their attention to the melted glacier now aware of Katara cradling its occupant. Laying there amidst the ice and snow, his body still glowing ever so slightly, was a boy. But not just any boy. An airbender. The last airbender. Yes, that was the day everything changed. The day we uncovered. The Avatar. I knew at once that this boy was him. The Avatar. 
And how could I not? I saw at a glance, the endless power trapped within him. Just as I knew he was, most likely, the last of the airbenders. Many things became clear to me that day, chief amongst them that this avatar of the elements only retained the knowledge of his former lives in his avatar state. He was just a 12-year-old boy, trapped within an iceberg for nearly an entire century. He did not have all the answers, did not hold the knowledge I sought. All these years, for naught. But I knew. This avatar, this boy would do great things. To this day, I know not how. I simply knew. Nothing escapes these eyes. Why are you staring at me? This from Aang, the boy who, unbeknownst to everyone else, was the avatar. Naruto stubbornly stifled the urge to reveal that. Aang would so when he was ready. Or so he hoped. He was hesitant to pin his trust on an untested youth, but hadn't he been the same once? To assume Ong was a coward merely for safeguarding his secret would imply that Naruto too was one and the same, unwilling to risk death by exposing himself to the world with his godlike powers and prowess. But he did not hide his powers out of cowardice. It was wisdom that stayed his hand, wielding that much power letting the world know what you were only made you that much more of a target. Perhaps Ong was of a similar mind. Perhaps not. In a way, they were almost alike. Regardless, it wasn't for Naruto to judge. Oh, nothing. Nevertheless, he allowed a small smile to creep up on his lips. It's just my first time meeting the Avatar. His words were soft, spoken only for the two of them and, yet they still elicited the most startling reaction in the young airbender. For a brief moment, the young boy actually looked afraid. Said fear was just as swiftly replaced by sorrow, the resigned sort that suggested he'd known this was coming all along. Most curious, the Avatar of the Gods mused to himself. How did you? No. Naruto finished with the slightest of sighs. It wasn't that difficult. I've studied this nation's history, if that flash of power before didn't give you away, then the markings certainly did. Honestly, I'd expected you to be a little taller, though. Older, too. But then again, I guess cryogenically freezing yourself for a hundred years is one huluva way to ease out the wrinkles, no. He allowed his gaze to slip past the baffled boy toward his young wards, observing Sokka and Katara with their tribe. They'll probably figure it out sooner rather than later. So are you going to tell them, or should I? Ong faltered, momentarily uncertain of what to say. Just who was this strange youth, and why did he seem so familiar somehow? He hadn't said a word on the ride back to the tribe courtesy of Appa and now suddenly it was as if the blonde could read his very thoughts. What was going on here? I. There's no rush. Ironically, Naruto felt his heart go out to the boy with these words. You can tell them when you're ready. For all his feigned cheer and supposed legendary status, Aang was little more than that. A child. But there was more to it than being young and untested. Ong reminded him of Will himself. He'd been the same way at first, not wanting anything to do with these incredible powers bestowed upon him. In the beginning, he had tried and failed to live a normal life. Looking back, it was rather obvious why he had failed. One simply did not absorb the Juubi into oneself and expect to lead an existence anything short of extraordinary. At first there had been worship his comrades had respected him, women had practically fallen over another to have his children, and so on, for a terribly long time, he had been reluctant to assume his new role. He didn't want anything to do with these supposed fangirls or their ilk, he only had eyes for a certain Yuga. Hanada. Her confession had never been far from his mind, but there hadn't been any time to discuss it, what with Akatsuki lurking about and then the war and Madara, by the time everything ended and the Juubi was harmlessly or, so he thought made one with his soul, nearly a year had passed. More than enough time for him to think on her words. And when things finally settled down, finally able to call her out on it. The rest well, as they say, is history. Time had flown by so swiftly afterward, now more than ever he wished he could go back and revisit those first few years, cherish them, before he realized anything was wrong. Before it became apparent that he wasn't changing. Wasn't aging. But he'd been so caught up in their relationship, and then the twins came along, and still he'd pushed it off dismissing it as nothing. Lie after lie became increasingly apparent. He was simply aging well. It was his genes. Yes, that had to be it. Looking back, he'd been far too naive. Reluctant. That reluctance had nearly been the end of him. Everyone saw him as a god in human form at the time, a guardian meant to watch over the shinobi people for all time. Not as the Hokage, but something more. As an avatar. Of the gods. To this day, Naruto wasn't sure who had coined that eerie moniker, but for whatever reason it had stuck. So that was what he became, eventually trading his dream to become Hokage for this newfound role and status. And for a while, things were working out swimmingly. Sasuke had returned to the village his promise with Sakura is satisfied and he had a budding family in Hinata. As Hokage, Tsunade was able to help him keep the peace and awkward as he might be, he'd done a good job of keeping the other nations in line. So he wasn't aging. Big deal. 
a mere fly in the ointment. A simple henge kept anyone from realizing the truth, and it wasn't as though he'd been lying to anyone. With his newfound powers he'd slowly begun to assume his new responsibilities. Dot peace was flourishing. The people were happy. And then, as suddenly as the peace had begun. Everything went to hell. You're not exactly normal yourself. Naruto blinked, unexpectedly drawn from his pained reverie by Ong's words. He was momentarily amused to find the boy peering up at him with what was the word again. Compassion. Empathy. Whatever the case, Ong's attention was enough to momentarily banish the demons of his long and lengthy past. I'm sorry, did you say something? When next Naruto spoke it was not the sorrowed shinobi of the elemental nations, but the stoic avatar of the gods. Granted, taking on the role growing into it over time learning to respect the need for secrecy, adopting the title even now, it was all just a way of distancing himself from the pain he still felt in the depths of his heart. Whereas Ong's outlook on life was probably a great deal cheerier than his own, in any case. Perhaps he should mirror that same levity. I said, the last airbender continued, you're not so different yourself. Oh? That got Naruto's attention. This boy was more than he appeared. Intrigued, he turned his sapphiric gaze toward the monk to be once more. And what makes you say that, Ong? Quashing the pain he felt within his heart, he forced a small smile back to his face and awaited the avatar's answer. Oh, what he wouldn't give for Kurama's voice in his head right about now. It's your eyes. The boy seemed to squirm beneath his gaze. They seem old, somehow. You'd be right. Naruto found himself biting back laughter for the first time since his last death. If I had to guess, I'd say they're 500, give or take a century or two. What? It's just a guess. The blonde shrugged. No need to freak out. Time sorta loses its meaning when you've lived as long as I have. Still, freezing yourself an interesting trick. I think I'll have to try that myself, someday. Well, I wouldn't recommend it. So you're really an airbender, eh? Naruto asked abruptly. Bong grinned, glad for the change in topic. Sure am. Can you show me? I ah. Uh. Bong chose that precise moment to sneeze the subsequent expulsion of air sent him rocketing nearly 10 feet into the air. That little spectacle earned the attention of the entire tribe not to mention a certain someone before he descended with grace, landing almost effortlessly upon Appa's back, ending his little air trick with a graceful bow. As if to echo his partner's effort, the sky bison low a seat a happy snort. Not bad, huh? Impressive. Naruto admitted, clapping as the bender clambered down from his mount. You've got a lot of skill for someone so young. Hey, thanks. But can you do this? Now it was Ong's turn to balk, because scarce had Naruto spoken than the last airbender found himself witness to the inexplicable. Naruto in the time it had taken to finish that sentence had levitated his body up off the ground and into the air. He was hovering. Without a glider. He simply hung there, suspended in midair. What's more, he didn't seem to be expending any visible effort at all. But it wasn't as though he were flying in actuality Ong thought, if he could, then why would he? Wahahaha. Then as if to shatter that very thought, the former Jinchuriki shed his fur coat and erupted upward, his body little more than a streak of blue and black colors, as he tore into the skies. What the heck? Sokka scrubbed at his eyes with both hands, as though the action could somehow wipe away what he was seeing. Is Naruto actually? Flying Katara practically squealed in delight at the sight, her earlier reservation forgotten in the wake of this discovery. For indeed the blonde was doing just that, navigating the air using his own chakra to hold hoist him aloft, wrapping himself in it, and pushing down against the ground simultaneously. It was no means an easy feat, only one with a strong wind affinity could do such a thing, and even then, Naruto himself had spent nearly an entire decade mastering the technique. It was not, as a certain man might have said, a move for beginners. Wow, so you're an airbender, too. I am not a bender. Naruto denied, alighting soundlessly beside Katara. My situation is unique. Like how? Like. He would have said more, had not something brightened the skies over their heads. Blue eyes bulged. Incoming. That was all they heard before a massive ball of fire lit the horizon. Ong barely saw the Fire Nation vessel from whence it came before it engulfed their position. But where had this vessel come from? And how had they found them so swiftly? Too late, there was no longer any time for thought, the projectile ripped into the water tribe and sent everything flying. The villagers were only just able to escape the blast radius, thanks to their relative distance of the, the explosion. Katara wasn't so lucky. The detonation flung her and Sokka away, sending both brother and sister sprawling in the snow. In that instant, Naruto shouted something from up above their heads, exactly what the young avatar knew not. Only that the flames abruptly vanished, disintegrating into harmless steam as he looked on. Assholes. Naruto landed in a roaring snarl of fire, spitting curses not meant for the ears of young children. Some of those very words caused Katara to flush, but the sight of him stole any sentiment of laughter away. 
Black flames rippled off and around his body, and it seemed as though his eyes were bleeding. Impossible to tell. Whatever the case may be, she had only an instant to recognize any of this, before unconsciousness took her before the blonde Yusa heard on behind him, just in time for the ramp of the enemy vessel to lower. Stay behind me. Was the last thing she heard. Seven firebenders marched down the ramp in a phalanx, and at their head, a younger man, clearly their leader. Where are you hiding him? The prince demanded to know. Scowling, he grabbed hold of Katara's grandmother, shaking her cowl for emphasis. He'd be about this age, master, of all elements. I know he's here. None dared speak. Faced with this refusal, Zuko became incensed. If you don't reveal him, I'll burn this entire village to the ground. Ong was just about to open his mouth, ready to reveal himself for the sake of these people, when. The Matarasu. The blonde muttered that word and the firebenders burned, their plated armor erupting in thick tongues of dark fury as she looked on. Of the six guards that had accompanied the prince, only one managed to evade the worst of the blaze besides him, rolling aside and out of harm's way. Naruto simply exhaled and that hapless fool ceased to exist, his body evaporating before a massive fireball all his own. Wah firebender. Why does everyone think that? Naruto groaned, slapping a flaming palm to his forehead. It's not like Io. He blinked, finally noticing the flames of his chakra creeping around him, the still smoldering bodies around the laugh of them. Whoops. Forgot about that. Chakra tends to get a little out of whack when I'm pissed off you know. Ah, but I digress. The wave of the hand and the flames abated somewhat, forming a shimmering aura of black and crimson around his form. The noise that followed would be impossible to do justice to using simple onomatopoeic sound effects. It was not quite a voom, a simple vroom doesn't suffice either, but these are about the closest approximations. For Prince Zuko, the sound equated to one, singular emotion. Fear. Ong. Naruto whispered. How many people can Appa carry? About ten. The avatar found himself replying. It'll have to do. Try to get out of here, I'll buy you some time. What are you whispering about? Like an iron trap, Naruto's gaze locked onto the prince's own. The sheer intensity of his stare, the sudden ice in his expression, was enough to silence the entire tribe. Nothing moved. Nothing at all. And then he spoke, voice black as pitch, eyes cold as the coldest winter, a sharp contrast to the flames boiling around his body. These people are precious to me. The words were little more than a dry hiss if a knife could talk, this was what it would sound like. Any attack on them is an attack on myself, and I don't take very kindly to being set upon by the likes of Fire Nation thugs like Yusuf. He pointed one long finger at the proud prince. I suggest you get back on your boat and before you get yourself hurt, boy. Do you have any idea who you're speaking to? Zuko's scarred eye twitched in anger and outrage. I could ask you the same thing. Naruto's grin grew another inch, exposing deadly canine teeth. But since you seem to think I'm a firebender, let's play a little game. He stepped forward, reached out towards the bulk of their vessel, and made a pulping motion with his right hand. If I win, I get to peel your ship like a banana and set you adrift for a few days. You win, and I'll give you the avatar. Tell me, my dear prince, are you at all familiar with the term Kai? What I he what? Zuko spluttered. How dare you suggest such a thing, you traitor. Naruto snockered. Ara, it seems I've struck an old wound. Wouldn't have anything to do with that mark now, would? Zuko let loose an emotionally toiled scream and lunged, fists ablaze. I'll kill you. Oh, Ong. Naruto roared, a heartbeat before the prince pounced upon him. And then he no longer had any time to worry about anyone other than himself. Fighting at full strength was one thing, but to actively restrain himself from using his full potential against such a lesser opponent soon proved far more difficult or not. Naruto laughed as Zuko's fist swung harmlessly over his head. Too wide. Not narrow enough. The blast of fire that came with the strike was batted aside so effortlessly it may as well not have existed at all. Was this what amounted to Tejutsu these days? Pitiful. Absurd. He clapped his hands and flung them outward, that easy effortless gust of wind chakra was all it took to keep the boy off balance and summerly off his back, he simply couldn't make any progress against the headwind. Ha! He scolded. What's wrong, Zuko? Your great-grandfather was better than this. The prince snarled, utterly unaware of the bison rising behind him. Hide me like a man, Avatar. Naruto scoffed and spat a small fireball. Look, the blonde drawled as he battled the boy backwards, how many times do I have to tell you I'm not the Avatar? His words ended in a resounding whoosh as he summoned forth a great geyser of water from deep within his stomach, spewing the violent wave forward. Extinguishing the fiery blast and bowling the prince head over heels. But the young firebender simply would not go down. Scarce had he fallen than he was up again, flinging himself at the former Jinchuriki in furious fashion. Stop lying. He snarled between blows, only the avatar could manipulate the elements like that. Naruto's deadpan was barely concealed. 
Oh for the love of fine. You want me to fight like a firebender? Naruto shrugged, and it suddenly seemed that a great weight had been lifted from him, a tremendous effort he no longer had to sustain. Then I'll fight like a firebender. With a laugh he thundered forward, nearly clotheslining the poor prince. What did you do Zuko hissed, panic edging into his voice as he skittered backwards. Naruto's gleeful expression certainly didn't help any. I decided to fight you seriously. Appa. Ong's voice seemed to come from a great distance, yip, yip. The tar managed to open her eyes, but the world wouldn't stay still and stop shaking. The ringing in her ears wouldn't stop either. Sitting up was not as hard as she expected, but a loud rustling broke through the ringing of her rars, piles of snow subtle shifted, thrown off not by her meager arms, but by the blazing heat of the atmosphere itself. The most casual application of the combatant strength. She could feel the rest of their tribe stirring nervously around her small as it was, they all fight on Appa's back, the easier to be fielded to safety. As she stepped slowly back into the land of consciousness, she gradually became aware of a rhythmic crashing noise, the footfalls of a sprinting giant. Her Kai sense was the last to return, and with that to aid her, she was finally able to pinpoint the sources of the noise only a few yards below. Prince Zuko was still furiously attacking Naruto, relentlessly hammering down blows on the blonde's guard, which stubbornly held. That in and of itself, the fusion of her friend's refined martial arts skill, the product of decades of dedicated training, and his own monstrous natural power, gave him an unbelievably quick, fluid and adaptable defense and, when he moved onto the attack. Each strike was carefully calculated for maximum effect, almost impossible to follow, and devastating when it landed. It was like watching a river flow, not a single movement was wasted. And Zuko was overwhelmed. The younger boy didn't stand a chance, when he tried to retreat, the blonde cut him off, when he sought to strike and attack, Naruto simply absorbed all his blows, and while the occasional fist would slip through, he didn't seem to much care for the burns. Always Naruto was there, pressing, pressing, pressing the offensive with a single-minded ferocity bordering on downright primal instinct. Abruptly as their bout began, it was over. Zuko toppled backwards from a fireball to the chest, his armor shattering, stomach now badly burned. Naruto bounded after him, swiped him off his feet with a single hand, ready to deal the final blow. Zuko gazed back at him, golden eyes defiant, ready to accept whatever fate might be his. Finish it, Avatar. Before Katatara could think to say anything, lest she try to stop him the blonde struck down. Hard. Not with his fist, but with his head, the final blow not dealing death, yet rendering the prince insensate all the same. He rose stifly after that, Naruto did, extra chong what looked like a small brush and ink from his coat pocket. He promptly set to work on Zuko's face seconds thereafter, his fine brush strokes growing mad and erratic, as he hastened to complete his work before the proud prince stirred. Whatever he was writing, Katara couldn't see it, but it seemed to be sending Socket into a fit of hysterical laughter. Then, incredibly, Naruto spoke. Not the Zuko, but to the ship itself. Or perhaps he spoke to the portly figure sitting upon its bow. Iro. He shouted. I let your nephew live this time. Tell him he needs to be stronger to face me. Speaking of which, you may want to hang on. With that, he pointed hand toward the ship. Then he did something inexplicable. In the blink of an eye, without any discernible motion on his part, he destroyed the vessel's engines, warped its hull, and bodily wrenched the ice cutter onto land with a not-so-subtle application of Shinra Tensei. Another leap sent the blonde soaring into the air and onto Appa's saddle. When asked if he was alright, the whiskered warrior merely grunted. I've had enough excitement for one day. At first, I couldn't believe it. Even now, the thought still leaves me reeling, sometimes. All the airbenders. Gone. He limated. Put the sword. Burn at the torch. You get the picture. At Ong's behest we'd gone to visit the Southern Air Temple, expecting to find what, exactly. I didn't much seem the point at the time, but who was I to deny his request? We'd already escaped from the Fire Nation, drawing them away from Katara's family and tribe at the risk of our own skins, somehow along the way, Katara developed a desire to travel to the North Pole and master waterbending alongside Ong. And of course, Sokka decided to come as well. I was just along for the ride, who was I to say where they could and could not go, in Ong's shoes, wouldn't I do the same? Would I not jump at the chance to see if all my old friends were still alive? So away we went, their expectations high. Mine remained low. What we found there was only ruin. Old bones, battered armor, shredded garments and shattered skulls. Ong nearly lost himself. And who could blame him? My own rage for the Fire Nation grew tenfold that day. But what could I do? Even I can't bring back someone who's been dead for more than a century. I'd just be breathing life back into Jayatso's bones, without his flesh and organs, he wouldn't last more than a few seconds at the most, and that's being generous. It broke my heart to tell Ong this, that despite all my power, the monks were simply too fair gone. I'll never forget that look of heartbreak on his face. 
some avatar of the gods I am. Still, my heart goes out to these kids. Katara said that we're Ong's family now. Oddly enough, I find myself agreeing with her. And by the gods, if anyone tries to lay a hand on my family. I. Will. Break. Them. A simple task, considering we only had Zuzu to worry about at the time. Fee. That little flame was no threat to myself or Ong. Truly, I had no fears when we arrived on the Isle of Kiyoshi. Indeed, one could even say I had become complacent. It never once occurred to me that someone else might join in the hunt for us. Suu. Naruto stubbornly resisted the urge to open his eyes, refusing to turn his head and peer over a shoulder as Ong popped up behind him. Thank the gods Appa could fly himself. Instead of giving in to his own curiosity, he forced his mind to focus on the task at hand. Not now, Ong. He chided. I'm trying to concentrate. He was sitting in a meditative position and concentrating on his outstretched right hand. After a few seconds what looked like blue Kaido Ong began to swirl around his palm. It began to compress in upon itself as more and more began form and swirl. Soon enough, floating a few inches above his palm was a blue spinning orb. He saw Naruto's eyes focus on the orb, and it began to spin even faster, and form four white blades spinning with the orb. As he watched the orb spin, the last airbender could have sworn he heard a low thrumming, like something was trying to cut the air itself. What in the world is that? The orb continued to spin, growing larger and larger, encompassing his entire palm until Naruto let out a sigh and relaxed, letting the orb disappear. Good, he said to himself. I've stllll got it. It was then that he became aware of everyone's attention. Katara had paused and stitching Sokka's pants to gop at him, her mouth forming a small, round O of disbelief. Saka looked as though he'd been preparing another one of his infamous jokes, but the sight of the mini Rasen shuriken seemed to have stolen those words away. Finally, he looked at Ong, apparently confused by the boy's bowed head and lack of reaction. Is something the matter? That. That. That was so cool. The sheer force of boy's exultation nearly knocked the shinobi off the bison, thankfully he managed to right himself and levitate at the last instant. In matter of moments he rejoined them, alighting effortlessly upon the saddle once more, though looking no less pleased for the effort. Boy. He cried. Are you trying to knock me off app or something? You've gotta show me how to do that. Ong would not be dissuaded so easily. Naruto's expression turned somber. I can't. He replied. And even if I could, I still wouldn't teach you. Oh, but why not? This attack is meant to be used as a last resort and nothing more. The blonde countered, eyes hidden beneath his roughened bangs. If I were to unleash it on someone, say a firebender for example, it would damage them so badly they'd never be able to bend again. That is a fate I would wish on no man or woman, no matter how vile. He cracked an uneasy grin, then, a vain attempt to lighten the mood. Hey, why the long faces, guys? I may be a monster, but at least I'm on your side, you know. A somber silence followed those words broken only by the wind and their hair ongs lack thereof and the passing of the clouds over and under their heads. Finally, someone decided to break it. You're not a monster, Naruto. Naruto looked up, startled to find Katara's hand on his own. Lo Katara, I appreciate the sentiment, but let's be honest here. I killed those firebenders back there, only sparing the prince on a whim. Hell, I enjoyed the killing. Do you hear me? It felt good. If that doesn't make me a monster then I don't know what. You are not, she repeated firmly, a monster. What's wrong with you? Naruto lips parted in reply, but her other hand clamped over his mouth before he could speak. Why would you even think such a thing after all you've said and done for us? Why, Ong is still alive, because of you. Our tribe wasn't destroyed by the Fire Nation because of you. Sokka and I are still standing here. Because. Of. You. If protecting those you care for makes you a monster, then I'm one too. Something in those teary blue eyes of hers struck and forestalled him, preventing any argument on his part from pressing the issue any further. With that, Naruto relented. All right all right. He sighed, pushing a hand across her head. By the gods, girl, don't start bawling on me now. Um are you two done fighting? The Tara promptly flushed, pulled away, and went back to sewing Sokka's pants. We weren't fighting, Ong. Yeah, Sokka sighed good-naturedly. Stop bugging her, airhead. You need to give girls space when they do their sewing. What does me being a girl have to do with sewing? There was a dangerous glint in Katara's eye now, an accusatory tone that, for those who knew her, would cause them to duck for cover. Sokka made the foolish and nearly fatal mistake of pressing the issue. Simple. He replied, uncrossing his arms behind his head. Girls are better at fixing pants than guys. And guys are better at hunting and fighting and stuff like that. It's just the natural order of things. Naruto and Ong simultaneously facipumed, they recognized the verbal gaffe, but did Sokka. Nope. The young warrior of the water tribe realized his mistake far too late. All done with your pants. 
His sister held up the half-stitched article of clothing and flung it in his face. And look what a great job I did. Wait. I was just kidding. I can't wear these. Katara, please. Relax Sokka, where we're going you won't need any pants. We're here. Elephant Koi. Naruto watched with bemusement as his fellow avatar rode the giant fish. It wasn't until something started to eat those massive koi that he began to worry. What if something happened to him? He wasn't exactly keen on saving the world by himself, and if Ong died he wouldn't reincarnate for quite some time. Not to mention he'd be reborn in the Water Tribe, and any chance of him learning airbending would go out the window ga. A small chuckle fled his lips, unbidden, as Ong sped away from the gigantic creature, running across the water's surface through sheer speed alone, before slamming into Sokka seconds thereafter. In the end, his efforts weren't even needed after all. What was that thing? Katara wondered. I don't know. Naruto already knew. Probably an Anagi. He stepped back toward the shallows whilst Katara went to check on Ong and her now considerably battered brother. They're native to these parts, after all. Well, Inagi or not, I'd rather not stick around. Sokka decided, dusting himself off. Time to hit the Ruu what the heck. Everything happened so swiftly. One moment they were standing beneath the trees, listening to Sokka. The next, four shadows leapt from the branches and attacked them. In the time that it took Naruto to turn his head Sokka, Katara, Ivanong and Momo, were all subdued, bound and blindfolded, thrown down to the sands at his feet. Naruto was spared only because he'd been standing near the beach. It gave him just enough time to realize their attackers weren't men as he'd first suspected, but women. No, not even that. Girls. Oh, Sokka is gonna be so pissed when he wakes up. Then the girls turned around to face Naruto. It was impossible to distinguish one from the other he realized, what with the white makeup that covered their faces entirely, those red and black accents around their eyes lending their visages, an almost regal appearance beyond the metal headdress and armored battle dress they wore. These strange female warriors looked at him for a long instance, before turning to face him as one, the combined movement causing their armored dresses to rustle, ever so slightly. It was alluring in a way. To say anything less would belittle their strength. Despite himself, the blonde felt the beginnings of a small smile work its way across his whiskered visage. I don't suppose we could sit down and talk about this over a cup of tea. Suddenly, and without warning, one of them attacked. Naive. Naruto simply swung his hand forward and punched with a fifth of his full strength, the sheer shockwave of the strike, summoning forth a great gust, ripping her from her feet and hurtling her across the beach. He'd sked softly as she skidded across the sands in a tangle of arms and legs, he'd forgotten just how fragile the people of this land could be. And we just discussed this like civilized folk. He addressed the remaining three, hoping to refrain from further violence. It was not to be. They struck up their fans and moved to encircle him, but slowly this time wary of this sudden and unseen burst of power. Their painted faces betrayed very little, perhaps the slightest twinge of concern for their injured kin, but nothing more. Look, this is pointless. Naruto continued. You're just going to end up on the ground like her. When the fate of their ally did not dissuade the remaining three warriors, the avatar of the gods took it upon himself to strike respect into their proud hearts. Not with close combat of course, even he might find himself at a bit of a disadvantage when holding back and facing three warriors like this in their native land. So, the the knuckle-headed ninja did what came best to him. He improvised. Four flicks of his fingers summoned forth a massive dragon of water, its golden eyes narrow and intent, as it took stock of the four girls, their fallen comrade having only just reclaimed her footing. Interesting. So these girls were capable of withstanding him at a feeble fifth of his strength. One of the warriors saw fit to give voice to her awe. What in the world? Suriu no Jutsu. Water Dragon Jutsu, Naruto exhaled softly and abruptly loosed the tentative leash he kept upon his Jutsu. With a roar that would have put the Anagi to shame, it lunged forwards. Two of the girls weren't swift enough to evade its watery maw, they found themselves swept away by the roaring tide as the beast impacted upon the beach. Their bodies were wrenched angrily against the trees, twisted to join the prone forms of his three friends, coughing and sputtering as the wall of water receded. Do down. Do to go. Resigning himself to battle, the blonde beckoned the remaining huntresses forward. Come on, girls. Let's get this over with. The pair exchanged a hesitant tentative glance, clearly they weren't accustomed to fighting someone who could actually fight back, certainly not someone of his caliber. But they had their duty and he had his. As one they pounced, their fans little more than a golden blur. He toyed with them for that brief instant not too shabby amazed when one actually managed to scratch him with her fan, before a solid punch broke through his guard. Poof. Both girls balked as their opponent exploded into smoke, leaving a harmless log in his wake. What manner of sorcery was this? Where was he? Where had he gone? Suki, where did he? I don't know, Caillou beneath you. 
Her words ended in a frightened cry as a pair of hands burst through the sand, latching onto her friend's ankles. Before either of them could hope to react, their owner yanked down. Hard. Kai loosed a startled cry her eyes scrunching shut as she prepared to be buried up to her neck. Those same eyes flew open, startled to find that while she had indeed been buried beneath the sands, it was only to her neck. It was a rather surreal experience, being unable to move anything above her neck, forced to look up at her leader. Hi. I'm alright, the girl tried to shrug, but failed, I think. Breathe down. Of course she's alright. A familiar voice chided. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not trying to harm you. Her companion whirled around as Naruto emerged from the earth beside them, covered in sand. Without so much as a glance in Tsuki's direction, he began to stride back toward his bound friends. He didn't have even a scratch on him, if anything, he looked amused by their efforts. Wait. Naruto stopped in his tracks, his face slowly appearing over his shoulder as he curiously regarded his once fallen opponent. A look of irritation crossed his single eye as it regarded the recovering warrior behind him, her painted face narrow in a rectus of confusion. Did you want something? What did you do to her? She demanded to know. Naruto laughed and looked away again. Earth style. He admonished with a waggling finger. Headhunter Jutsu. She won't be moving for a while oh. He gave an amused grunt as Tsuki seized him from behind, her arms wrapping around his shoulders in a full Nelson, and with surprising strength for someone of her size, wrenching him up off his feet. You got me. He laughed as he fell, toppling backwards to the sands. Clever, girl. But. With a hiss, he opened his mouth and spat, expelling a vicious stream of fire in the same instant that his face would have hit the sands. A flash of recognition flickered through Tsuki's mind just then. He'd used air to send one of her friends flying, water to take down two more, earth to immobilize Kaiyu, and now fire, could he really be? Be but that's impossible. Not for me it isn't. Naruto never let up in his barrage, not once. Each blast pushed him another inch up into the air and caused the temperature to spike. This sudden expulsion of heat forced the Kayashi warrior to loosen her hold upon the shinobi or be burned allowing him to wrench himself free and let loose a bone-juring strike of his own design. Tsuki lost all semblance of breath as an armored shin crunched into her equally armored stomach and the later yielded. The blow wasn't crippling, but it did send her staggering away and give him time to rise. Time he gladly took. Naruto stood amidst the now glassy sand, his body still shimmering with heat, his hair rippling in the steam created by his last attack. His entire body seemed to ripple with barely suppressed energy, it was like gazing into the sun's light over long, stare at it, and you'd only be burned. Enough. He declared. You've fought well, but that last blow's gunna to one haluva bruise, I know you're hurting right now, and I'd rather you not exacerbate the injury. Honestly, the girl expected her to fling herself at him in spite of her injuries and begin her offense anew. Imagine his surprise when Tsuki threw down her fans and fell to a knee. I knew it, she gasped, clutching at her side. You're the avatar. Crap. He'd been too focused again. Me? Why me? He asked with surprise. I'm nothing special. Don't lie. Anger sharpened her tone. You used fire, earth, water and air. No other bender can do that. I suppose you wouldn't listen to me if I told you I wasn't a bender. Sincerity warmed her expression somewhat, so too did her misunderstanding. Look, you don't have to be shy about it, I can understand if you'd want to keep it a secret. But I you don't I'm not Naruto groaned. Oh for the love of help me out here, Ong. MMMPH. The boy's words were muffled around his gag. Naruto sweat dropped. The situation was rapidly unraveling. If this continued, if Tsuki told the others in her village everyone would think he was the avatar. A horrible realization dawned on him, one he never wanted to experience again, not if he could avoid it. Um can I have a minute to untie my friends? Tsuki nodded. Naruto swiftly did just that, unbidding Katara and the others in the blink of an eye. Strategy meeting. He hissed. Now. What's wrong, Naruto? Katara asked. They think I'm the avatar, that's what. Sokka adopted a thoughtful expression. And that's a problem. Naruto glared bloody red daggers at him. Look, I've got an idea. I object. Sokka frowned. You haven't even heard it yet, Naruto. Boy, I know you. And I know this is a bad idea. Look, Naruto might not be a bender, but at this rate, everyone will think he is. Right. At everyone's nod, he pressed forward. Well, I say let them. Naruto immediately opened his mouth to veto that, but Sokka kept at it before the blonde wrong could get a word in edgewise. Now wait just a minute, both of you. Hear me out. Right now, who is Prince Hothead hunting, Ong? You, or Naruto? Who does he think is the avatar? The Tara tilted her head, she hadn't considered that question until this very moment. Ong? Do you know the answer? Naruto. The young avatar was beginning to see where this plan was going, and he didn't like it. Not one bit. Naruto was of the same mind. 
it felt like he was stealing the poor boy's thunder. That just wasn't his style, nor did he enjoying wresting the claim to fame away from another. For Sokka to ask such a thing of him no. He couldn't do it. It wasn't just his humility he'd worked so hard to keep the Fire Nation from pestering him after his last death, and while he was already living a life on the run, he wasn't exactly keen on advertising his powers. I can't believe I'm saying this Boo Sokka has a point. Katara. You too. It would give Ong all the time in the world to focus on his bending. The waterbender persisted. Besides, I've seen how much skill you have with the elements. Even though you're not a bender, you could still pass for the avatar, easily. Why are you fighting us on this? Because I don't want to do it. Naruto argued. And you're forgetting about Ong. How does he feel about all this? Three pairs of eyes focused upon the last airbender. Well Ong, what do you think? Sokka and Katara ask almost simultaneously. Naruto shook his head rapidly, a silent plea for him to say no. Poor boy, he actually flinched. Does it really matter? Think of it this way. Sokka pointed out, we know for a fact that Naruto can handle almost anything the Fire Nation throws at him. We all know you're strong Ong, but if something happened to you, well, I don't know what we'd do. The Avatar might be reborn, but there's only one you. Now that we have Naruto, we actually have an option. And while he is the Avatar, just think how much free time you'd have. It'd be even easier to master the elements. The Avatar seemed to consider this. Naruto growled, deep and low in his throat. Horrible idea. Terrible idea. I think it's a winner. Sokka reaffirmed. Says the boy who was beaten by a girl. Naruto hissed. That was a fluke. Beeeite. Hey, do you want to save the world or not? That's low. Ong groaned. You guys, I have a bad feeling about this, but if it helps with my training. Let's do it. Sokka turned to his sister. I would like to state for the record that those words did not come out of my mouth. Naruto was still muttering to himself when he stalked back to Tsuki. Every fiber of his being railed against this, but he could see the need for it. As much as he might loathe that sometimes choices like this had be made, regardless of whether he liked them or not. With this in mind, he steeled himself to speak. What was all that about? She asked. Just a discussion of how long we intend to stay. The blonde lied. Still, you'd best gather your elders. I have a message for them. And what might that be? A delicate brow quirked in questioning. Tell them. But the avatar has returned. The word traveled like wildfire. The avatar had returned. And he was upon Kiyoshi. One would think it ironic that hearsay could move so swiftly, but it did. Word of mouth passing from a young girl to that of a fisherman on the docks of Kiyoshi, from said fisherman to that of an Earth Kingdom trader, work, then a Fire Nation cook, until at long last, those words reached the ears of a certain prince. For a moment, said Firebender could barely believe his luck. Here he had sat down to dinner, resolved to another sleepless night. What? Zuko lurched up from the dinner table, the steaming salmon on his plate now forgotten. The avatar is on Kiyoshi Island foolish words, spoken in anger and haste. Helmsman, change course at once. Unbeknownst to him, another became aware of that location as well. One week later. Naruto grunted as he parried his opponent's blow, using the same leverage against her to negate the force of her throw. She struggled back, trying to use his own strength against him, but his stance proved simply too solid for her to breach. Likewise, she proved too fluid to grasp without serious effort on his part, effort he wasn't willing to expend just yet. They stood there, a long moment, staring one another down, refusing to yield to give ground, to back down, to yield. Finally, at an unseen command, they broke apart. Their stance is getting better, the ex-shinobi found himself commending. Tsuki. I wish you'd stop holding back. She sighed, straightening and closing her fan. Hey, if I did that, it wouldn't be any fun. Was it just his imagination, or was that a flush beneath the facipant? He stood in a radically altered version of the Kiyoshi battle dress, contoured to fit his male physique. Minus the white facipant of course. Tradition or not he simply refused to go through that again. It had been hilarious to see Sokka wearing it yesterday, the poor boy didn't have any skill with a needle, and as such, had been forced to wear something similar to what his sparring partner wore. Before an unseen. Naruto, I. My lord avatar. Naruto looked up from his sparring session with Tsuki, momentarily discomfited by that title. Saka's plan was working well, everyone thought he was the avatar. Not Ong. It made sense from a certain point, while he drew attention, the young airbender could learn all the bending he required without the undue attention of being hunted by the Fire Nation. That didn't mean he had to like it though. Far from it he loathed this idea. The idea of taking credit for someone else had never sat well with him, having actual power had done little to temper that distaste. Nearly a full week had passed since their arrival in Kiyoshu, ironically, he had been the one to argue for their extended stay. He didn't know if it was Tsuki or the something else, he simply felt drawn here. But what was it? 
Suki was a nice girl after all he supposed, she'd warmed to him considerably during the last seven days, and although he remained loath to admit it, he did enjoy their spars, especially stop. Stop stop stop. That way lay ruin. Shaking himself from those treacherous thoughts Naruto rose, wiped the sweat from his brow, and turned to face the messenger standing in the door. Yes, what is it? Higher nation troops have landed in Kayashi. The blonde nearly fascipumed at the news. So much for this peace and quiet. Not Zuko again. Zuko? Suki asked as he slipped his armor on. These just some pesky prints I beat in the South Pole. Naruto replied, donning his jacket. Don't worry about it. In the meantime, I need you to get Ong and the others, we may need to bug out if things get heated in any case. But. Suki, I won't endanger your island any longer than I already have. A small pang twisted at his heart as he said this. In the lone week that they'd spent here, he'd actually felt normal. To leave that behind and voyage out into the unknown again was strangely disheartening. It was selfish of me to make everyone stay here this long, I've put you all in danger because of that. What, you don't think I can handle a few Fire Nation troops? She challenged as he slipped on the last of his armor. No, I understand that you're a warrior, but firebenders are way out of your league. So you just don't trust me, then. A pained note entered her tone, her painted face seemed strangely sad somehow. Damn it warrior girl, why won't you listen? Her hand closed around his wrist, holding him fast. Yes, I'm a warrior. She replied, her voice the barest whisper. Something soft touched his whiskered visage an instant later. But I'm also a girl. Naruto blinked, touching a hand to his cheek. Opened his mouth to speak, but it was already too late. Suki, she was gone, leaving him with his innermost thoughts. Where the hell had that come from? Strange creatures, women. Truly. He crossed the streets with swift strides, reaching the docks almost in no time at all. Oddly enough, he didn't encounter any firebenders. That was odd in and of itself. The closer he came to the docks the more certain he became, they were waiting for him there. The barge didn't even lower its ramp until he was a few feet away. Nevertheless, he prepared himself for battle. All right, Prince Hothead, he growled, flexing his fingers, are you ready for round two? I'd call it round one. The hell. Naruto was expecting Zuko to step off that ship and face him. Not a girl. Certainly not someone his age. Sheesh, first Suki and those Kayashi warriors, and now this. Why did he seem to be facing the opposite sex as of late? Was fate messing with him or something? It must be. So he stood there and watched wary as this newcomer surveyed her surroundings. There was something dangerous about her. He cold and quite put his finger on it, perhaps it was her aura. Or maybe it was the eyes. In any case Yuzumaki Naruto, avatar of the gods, found himself just a touch uncomfortable. So, this is Kayashi Island. The girl murmured to herself as she disembarked. It seems father was right to plant that spy on Zuzu's ship after all. And now I've beaten him to the punch. How wonderful. She extended her slim shoulder in a shrug. Honestly, what more could a girl ask for? Suddenly wary, Naruto edged a foot forward. This girl wasn't like the others he'd fought. Erm you're not Zuko. The girl saw him and smiled then, it was a soft deadly dangerous thing, that smile. Well, 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 what do we have here? She chuckled. You mean to say you're the avatar that I've heard so much about? Her gaze roamed across his lightly armored body with intrigue, a spark of interest shining in those dark orbs of hers. You certainly are handsome, I'll give you that. But you should be humbled. A hand rose in a fierce flourish of blue flame. You have the honor of addressing Azula, Princess of the Fire Nation. I do hope you've prepared yourself. For? Why, for the fight of your life, of course. Azula said it as though it were the most obvious thing in the world. You didn't think I rushed here ahead of my brother just to have tea now, did you? Despite himself and all his power, Naruto actually blanched behind his guard. Ah, Christ. Then his vision swelled with azure fire. At first, I couldn't believe it. Even now, the thought still leaves me reeling, sometimes. All the airbenders. Gone. He limited. Put the sword. Burn at the torch. You get the picture. At Ong's behest we'd gone to visit the Southern Air Temple, expecting to find what, exactly? I didn't much seem the point at the time, but who was I to deny his request? We'd already escaped from the Fire Nation, drawing them away from Katara's family and tribe at the risk of our own skins, somehow along the way, Katara developed a desire to travel to the North Pole and master waterbending alongside Ong. And of course, Sokka decided to come as well. I was just along for the ride, who was I to say where they could and could not go, in Ong's shoes, wouldn't I do the same? Would I not jump at the chance to see if all my old friends were still alive? So away we went, their expectations high. Mine remained low. What we found there was only ruin. Old bones, battered armor, shredded garments and shattered skulls. Ong nearly lost himself. And who could blame him? My own rage for the Fire Nation grew tenfold that day. 
but what could I do? Even I can't bring back someone who's been dead for more than a century. I'd just be breathing life back into Jayatso's bones, without his flesh and organs, he wouldn't last more than a few seconds at the most, and that's being generous. It broke my heart to tell Ang this, that despite all my power, the monks were simply too fair gone. I'll never forget that look of heartbreak on his face. Some avatar of the gods I am. Still, my heart goes out to these kids. Katara said that we're Ang's family now. Oddly enough, I find myself agreeing with her. And by the gods, if anyone tries to lay a hand on my family. I. Will. Break. Them. A simple task, considering we only had Zuzu to worry about at the time. Fee. That little flame was no threat to myself or Ong. Truly, I had no fears when we arrived on the Isle of Kiyoshi. Indeed, one could even say I had become complacent. It never once occurred to me that someone else might join in the hunt for us. Su. Naruto stubbornly resisted the urge to open his eyes, refusing to turn his head and peer over a shoulder as Ong popped up behind him. Thank the gods Appa could fly himself. Instead of giving in to his own curiosity, he forced his mind to focus on the task at hand. Not now, Ong. He chided. I'm trying to concentrate. He was sitting in a meditative position and concentrating on his outstretched right hand. After a few seconds what looked like blue Kaido Ong began to swirl around his palm. It began to compress in upon itself as more and more began form and swirl. Soon enough, floating a few inches above his palm was a blue spinning orb. He saw Naruto's eyes focus on the orb, and it began to spin even faster, and form four white blades spinning with the orb. As he watched the orb spin, the last airbender could have sworn he heard a low thrumming, like something was trying to cut the air itself. What in the world is that? The orb continued to spin, growing larger and larger, encompassing his entire palm until Naruto let out a sigh and relaxed, letting the orb disappear. Good, he said to himself. I've stlll got it. It was then that he became aware of everyone's attention. Katara had paused in stitching Sokka's pants to gop at him, her mouth forming a small, round O of disbelief. Saka looked as though he'd been preparing another one of his infamous jokes, but the sight of the mini Rasen shuriken seemed to have stolen those words away. Finally, he looked at Ong, apparently confused by the boy's bowed head and lack of reaction. Is something the matter? That. That. That was so cool. The sheer force of boy's exultation nearly knocked the shinobi off the bison, thankfully he managed to right himself and levitate at the last instant. In matter of moments he rejoined them, alighting effortlessly upon the saddle once more, though looking no less pleased for the effort. Boy. He cried. Are you trying to knock me off app or something? You've got to show me how to do that. Ong would not be dissuaded so easily. Naruto's expression turned somber. I can't. He replied. And even if I could, I still wouldn't teach you. Oh, but why not? This attack is meant to be used as a last resort and nothing more. The blonde countered, eyes hidden beneath his roughened bangs. If I were to unleash it on someone, say a firebender for example, it would damage them so badly they'd never be able to bend again. That is a fate I would wish on no man or woman, no matter how vile. He cracked an uneasy grin, then, a vain attempt to lighten the mood. Hey, why the long faces, guys? I may be a monster, but at least I'm on your side, you know. A somber silence followed those words broken only by the wind in their hair Ong's lack thereof and the passing of the clouds over and under their heads. Finally, someone decided to break it. You're not a monster, Naruto. Naruto looked up, startled to find Katara's hand on his own. Look Katara, I appreciate the sentiment, but let's be honest here. I killed those firebenders back there, only sparing the prince on a whim. Hell, I enjoyed the killing. Do you hear me? It felt good. If that doesn't make me a monster then I don't know what. You are not, she repeated firmly, a monster. What's wrong with you? Naruto lips parted in reply, but her other hand clamped over his mouth before he could speak. Why would you even think such a thing after all you've said and done for us? Why, Ong is still alive, because of you. Our tribe wasn't destroyed by the Fire Nation because of you. Sokka and I are still standing here. Because. Of. You. If protecting those you care for makes you a monster, then I'm one too. Something in those teary blue eyes of hers struck and forestalled him, preventing any argument on his part from pressing the issue any further. But that, Naruto relented. All right, all right. He sighed, pushing a hand across her head. By the gods, girl, don't start bawling on me now. Um, are you two done fighting? The Tara promptly flushed, pulled away, and went back to sewing Sokka's pants. We weren't fighting, Ong. Yeah, Sokka sighed good-naturedly. Stop bugging her, airhead. You need to give girls space when they do their sewing. What does me being a girl have to do with sewing? There was a dangerous glint in Katara's eye now, an accusatory tone that, for those who knew her, would cause them to duck for cover. Sokka made the foolish and nearly fatal mistake of pressing the issue. Simple. He replied, uncrossing his arms behind his head. 
girls are better at fixing pants than guys. And guys are better at hunting and fighting and stuff like that. It's just the natural order of things. Naruto and Ong simultaneously facipumed, they recognized the verbal gaffe, but did Sokka? Nope. The young warrior of the water tribe realized his mistake far too late. All done with your pants. His sister held up the half-stitched article of clothing and flung it in his face. And look what a great job I did. Wait. I was just kidding. I can't wear these. Katara, please. Relax Sokka, where we're going you won't need any pants. We're here. Elephant Koi. Naruto watched with bemusement as his fellow avatar rode the giant fish. It wasn't until something started to eat those massive koi that he began to worry. What if something happened to him? He wasn't exactly keen on saving the world by himself, and if Ong died he wouldn't reincarnate for quite some time. Not to mention he'd be reborn in the water tribe, and any chance of him learning airbending would go out the window Ga. A small chuckle fled his lips, unbidden, as Ong sped away from the gigantic creature, running across the water's surface through sheer speed alone, before slamming into Sokka seconds thereafter. In the end, his efforts weren't even needed after all. What was that thing? Katara wondered. I don't know. Naruto already knew. Probably an Anagi. He stepped back toward the shallows whilst Katara went to check on Ong and her now considerably battered brother. They're native to these parts, after all. Well, Anagi or not, I'd rather not stick around. Sokka decided, dusting himself off. Time to hit the Ruu what the heck. Everything happened so swiftly. One moment they were standing beneath the trees, listening to Sokka. The next, four shadows leapt from the branches and attacked them. In the time that it took Naruto to turn his head Sokka, Katara, Ivanong and Momo, were all subdued, bound and blindfolded, thrown down to the sands at his feet. Naruto was spared only because he'd been standing near the beach. It gave him just enough time to realize their attackers weren't men as he'd first suspected, but women. No, not even that. Girls. Oh, Sokka is gonna be so pissed when he wakes up. Then the girls turned around to face Naruto. It was impossible to distinguish one from the other he realized, what with the white makeup that covered their faces entirely, those red and black accents around their eyes lending their visages, an almost regal appearance beyond the metal headdress and armored battle dress they wore. These strange female warriors looked at him for a long instance, before turning to face him as one, the combined movement causing their armored dresses to rustle, ever so slightly. It was alluring in a way. To say anything less would belittle their strength. Despite himself, the blonde felt the beginnings of a small smile work its way across his whiskered visage. I don't suppose we could sit down and talk about this over a cup of tea. Suddenly, and without warning, one of them attacked. Naive. Naruto simply swung his hand forward and punched with a fifth of his full strength, the sheer shockwave of the strike, summoning forth a great gust, ripping her from her feet and hurtling her across the beach. He'd sked softly as she skidded across the sands in a tangle of arms and legs, he'd forgotten just how fragile the people of this land could be. And we just discussed this like civilized folk. He addressed the remaining three, hoping to refrain from further violence. It was not to be. They struck up their fans and moved to encircle him, but slowly this time wary of this sudden and unseen burst of power. Their painted faces betrayed very little, perhaps the slightest twinge of concern for their injured kin, but nothing more. Look, this is pointless. Naruto continued. You're just going to end up on the ground like her. When the fate of their ally did not dissuade the remaining three warriors, the avatar of the gods took it upon himself to strike respect into their proud hearts. Not with close combat of course, even he might find himself at a bit of a disadvantage when holding back and facing three warriors like this in their native land. So, the the knuckle-headed ninja did what came best to him. He improvised. Four flicks of his fingers summoned forth a massive dragon of water, its golden eyes narrow and intent, as it took stock of the four girls, their fallen comrade having only just reclaimed her footing. Interesting. So these girls were capable of withstanding him at a feeble fifth of his strength. One of the warriors saw fit to give voice to her awe. What in the world? Tsuriru no Jutsu. Water Dragon Jutsu, Naruto exhaled softly and abruptly loosed the tentative leash he kept upon his Jutsu. With a roar that would have put the Anagi to shame, it lunged forwards. Two of the girls weren't swift enough to evade its watery maw, they found themselves swept away by the roaring tide as the beast impacted upon the beach. Their bodies were wrenched angrily against the trees, twisted to join the prone forms of his three friends, coughing and sputtering as the wall of water receded. Do down. Do to go. Resigning himself to battle, the blonde beckoned the remaining huntresses forward. Come on, girls. Let's get this over with. The pair exchanged a hesitant tentative glance, clearly they weren't accustomed to fighting someone who could actually fight back, certainly not someone of his caliber. But they had their duty and he had his. As one they pounced, their fans little more than a golden blur. 
He toyed with them for that brief instant not too shabby amazed when one actually managed to scratch him with her fan before a solid punch broke through his guard. Poof. Both girls balked as their opponent exploded into smoke, leaving a harmless log in his wake. What manner of sorcery was this? Where was he? Where had he gone? Suki, where did he? I don't know, Caillou beneath you. Her words ended in a frightened cry as a pair of hands burst through the sand, latching onto her friend's ankles. Before either of them could hope to react, their owner yanked down. Hard. Caillou loosed a startled cry her eyes scrunching shut as she prepared to be buried up to her neck. Those same eyes flew open, startled to find that while she had indeed been buried beneath the sands, it was only to her neck. It was a rather surreal experience, being unable to move anything above her neck, forced to look up at her leader. Hi. I'm alright, the girl tried to shrug, but failed, I think. Bree down. Of course she's alright. A familiar voice chided. Contrary to popular belief, I'm not trying to harm you. Her companion whirled around as Naruto emerged from the earth beside them, covered in sand. Without so much as a glance in Tsuki's direction, he began to stride back toward his bound friends. He didn't have even a scratch on him, if anything, he looked amused by their efforts. Wait. Naruto stopped in his tracks, his face slowly appearing over his shoulder as he curiously regarded his once fallen opponent. A look of irritation crossed his single eye as it regarded the recovering warrior behind him, her painted face narrow in a rectus of confusion. Did you want something? What did you do to her? She demanded to know. Naruto laughed and looked away again. Earth style. He admonished with a waggling finger. Headhunter Jutsu. She won't be moving for a while oh. He gave an amused grunt as Tsuki seized him from behind, her arms wrapping around his shoulders in a full Nelson, and with surprising strength for someone of her size, wrenching him up off his feet. You got me. He laughed as he fell, toppling backwards to the sands. Clever, girl. But. With a hiss, he opened his mouth and spat, expelling a vicious stream of fire in the same instant that his face would have hit the sands. A flash of recognition flickered through Tsuki's mind just then. He'd used air to send one of her friends flying, water to take down two more, earth to immobilize Caillou, and now fire, could he really be? Be, but that's impossible. Not for me it isn't. Naruto never let up in his barrage, not once. Each blast pushed him another inch up into the air and caused the temperature to spike. This sudden expulsion of heat forced the Kayashi warrior to loosen her hold upon the shinobi or be burned allowing him to wrench himself free and let loose a bone-juring strike of his own design. Suki lost all semblance of breath as an armored shin crunched into her equally armored stomach and the later yielded. The blow wasn't crippling, but it did send her staggering away and give him time to rise. Time he gladly took. Naruto stood amidst the now glassy sand, his body still shimmering with heat, his hair rippling in the steam created by his last attack. His entire body seemed to ripple with barely suppressed energy, it was like gazing into the sun's light over long, stare at it, and you'd only be burned. Enough. He declared. You've fraught well, but that last blow's gunna to one haluva bruise, I know you're hurting right now, and I'd rather you not exacerbate the injury. Honestly, the girl expected her to fling herself at him in spite of her injuries and begin her offense anew. Imagine his surprise when Tsuki threw down her fans and fell to a knee. I knew it, she gasped, clutching at her side. You're the avatar. Crap. He'd been too focused again. Me? Why me? He asked with surprise. I'm nothing special. Don't lie. Anger sharpened her tone. You used fire, earth, water and air. No other bender can do that. I suppose you wouldn't listen to me if I told you I wasn't a bender. Sincerity warmed her expression somewhat, so too did her misunderstanding. Look, you don't have to be shy about it, I can understand if you'd want to keep it a secret. But I you don't I'm not Naruto groaned. Oh for the love of help me out here, Ong. MMMPH. The boy's words were muffled around his gag. Naruto sweat dropped. The situation was rapidly unraveling. If this continued, if Tsuki told the others in her village everyone would think he was the avatar. A horrible realization dawned on him, one he never wanted to experience again, not if he could avoid it. Um can I have a minute to untie my friends? Suki nodded. Naruto swiftly did just that, unbidding Katara and the others in the blink of an eye. Strategy meeting. He hissed. Now. What's wrong, Naruto? Katara asked. They think I'm the avatar, that's what. Sokka adopted a thoughtful expression. And that's a problem. Naruto glared bloody red daggers at him. Look, I've got an idea. I object. Sokka frowned. You haven't even heard it yet, Naruto. Boy, I know you. And I know this is a bad idea. Look, Naruto might not be a bender, but at this rate, everyone will think he is. Right. At everyone's nod, he pressed forward. Well, I say let them. Naruto immediately opened his mouth to veto that, but Sokka kept at it before the blonde wrong could get a word in edgewise. Now wait just a minute, both of you. Hear me out. 
Right now, who is Prince Hothead hunting, Ong? You, or Naruto? Who does he think is the avatar? The Tara tilted her head, she hadn't considered that question until this very moment. Ong? Do you know the answer? Naruto. The young avatar was beginning to see where this plan was going, and he didn't like it. Not one bit. Naruto was of the same mind. It felt like he was stealing the poor boy's thunder. That just wasn't his style, nor did he enjoy wresting the claim to fame away from another. For Sokka to ask such a thing of him no. He couldn't do it. It wasn't just his humility he'd worked so hard to keep the Fire Nation from pestering him after his last death, and while he was already living a life on the run, he wasn't exactly keen on advertising his powers. I can't believe I'm saying this Boo Sokka has a point. Katara. You too. It would give Ong all the time in the world to focus on his bending. The waterbender persisted. Besides, I've seen how much skill you have with the elements. Even though you're not a bender, you could still pass for the avatar, easily. Why are you fighting us on this? Because I don't want to do it. Naruto argued. And you're forgetting about Ong. How does he feel about all this? Three pairs of eyes focused upon the last airbender. Well Ong, what do you think? Sokka and Katara ask almost simultaneously. Naruto shook his head rapidly, a silent plea for him to say no. Poor boy, he actually flinched. Does it really matter? Think of it this way. Sokka pointed out, we know for a fact that Naruto can handle almost anything the Fire Nation throws at him. We all know you're strong on, but if something happened to you, well, I don't know what we'd do. The avatar might be reborn, but there's only one you. Now that we have Naruto, we actually have an option. And while he is the avatar, just think how much free time you'd have. It'd be even easier to master the elements. The avatar seemed to consider this. Naruto growled, deep and low in his throat. Horrible idea. Terrible idea. I think it's a winner. Sokka reaffirmed. Says the boy who was beaten by a girl. Naruto hissed. That was a fluke. B -e -e -ite. Hey, do you want to save the world or not? That's low. Ong groaned. You guys, I have a bad feeling about this, but if it helps with my training. Let's do it. Sokka turned to his sister. I would like to state for the record that those words did not come out of my mouth. Naruto was still muttering to himself when he stalked back to Tsuki. Every fiber of his being railed against this, but he could see the need for it. As much as he might loathe that sometimes choices like this had be made, regardless of whether he liked them or not. With this in mind, he steeled himself to speak. What was all that about? She asked. Just a discussion of how long we intend to stay. The blonde lied. Still, you'd best gather your elders. I have a message for them. And what might that be? A delicate brow quirked in questioning. Tell them. But the avatar has returned. The word traveled like wildfire. The avatar had returned. And he was upon Kayashi. One would think it ironic that hearsay could move so swiftly, but it did. Word of mouth passing from a young girl to that of a fisherman on the docks of Kiyashi, from said fisherman to that of an Earth Kingdom trader, work, then a Fire Nation cook, until at long last, those words reached the ears of a certain prince. For a moment, said Firebender could barely believe his luck. Here he had sat down to dinner, resolved to another sleepless night. What? Zuko lurched up from the dinner table, the steaming salmon on his plate now forgotten. The avatar is on Kiyashi Island foolish words, spoken in anger and haste. Helmsman, change course at once. Unbeknownst to him, another became aware of that location as well. One week later. Naruto grunted as he parried his opponent's blow, using the same leverage against her to negate the force of her throw. She struggled back, trying to use his own strength against him, but his stance proved simply too solid for her to breach. Likewise, she proved too fluid to grasp without serious effort on his part, effort he wasn't willing to expend just yet. They stood there, a long moment, staring one another down, refusing to yield to give ground, to back down, to yield. Finally, at an unseen command, they broke apart. Your stance is getting better, the ex-shinobi found himself commending. Tsuki. I wish you'd stop holding back. She sighed, straightening and closing her fan. Hey, if I did that, it wouldn't be any fun. Was it just his imagination, or was that a flush beneath the facipant? He stood in a radically altered version of the Kiyoshi battle dress, contoured to fit his male physique. Minus the white facipant of course. Tradition or not he simply refused to go through that again. It had been hilarious to see Sokka wearing it yesterday, the poor boy didn't have any skill with a needle, and as such, had been forced to wear something similar to what his sparring partner wore. Before an unseen. Naruto, I. My lord avatar. Naruto looked up from his sparring session with Tsuki, momentarily discomfited by that title. Saka's plan was working well, everyone thought he was the avatar. Not Ong. It made sense from a certain point, while he drew attention, the young airbender could learn all the bending he required without the undue attention of being hunted by the Fire Nation. That didn't mean he had to like it though. 
Far from it he loathed this idea. The idea of taking credit for someone else had never sat well with him, having actual power had done little to temper that distaste. Nearly a full week had passed since their arrival in Kiyashu, ironically, he had been the one to argue for their extended stay. He didn't know if it was Tsuki or the something else, he simply felt drawn here. But what was it? Tsuki was a nice girl after all he supposed, she'd warmed to him considerably during the last seven days, and although he remained loath to admit it, he did enjoy their spars, especially stop. Stop stop stop. That way lay ruin. Shaking himself from those treacherous thoughts Naruto rose, wiped the sweat from his brow, and turned to face the messenger standing in the door. Yes, what is it? Higher nation troops have landed in Kayashi. The blonde nearly fascipumed at the news. So much for this peace and quiet. Not Zuko again. Zuko? Tsuki asked as he slipped his armor on. He's just some pesky prince I beat in the South Pole. Naruto replied, donning his jacket. Don't worry about it. In the meantime, I need you to get Ong and the others, we may need to bug out if things get heated in any case. But. Tsuki, I won't endanger your island any longer than I already have. A small pang twisted at his heart as he said this. In the lone week that they'd spent here, he'd actually felt normal. To leave that behind and voyage out into the unknown again was strangely disheartening. It was selfish of me to make everyone stay here this long, I've put you all in danger because of that. What, you don't think I can handle a few Fire Nation troops? She challenged as he slipped on the last of his armor. No, I understand that you're a warrior, but firebenders are way out of your league. So you just don't trust me, then. A pained note entered her tone, her painted face seemed strangely sad somehow. Damned it warrior girl, why won't you listen? Her hand closed around his wrist, holding him fast. Yes, I'm a warrior. She replied, her voice the barest whisper. Something soft touched his whiskered visage an instant later. But I'm also a girl. Naruto blinked, touching a hand to his cheek opened his mouth to speak, but it was already too late. Suki, she was gone, leaving him with his innermost thoughts. Where the hell had that come from? Strange creatures, women. Truly. He crossed the streets with swift strides, reaching the docks almost in no time at all. Oddly enough, he didn't encounter any firebenders. That was odd in and of itself. The closer he came to the docks the more certain he became, they were waiting for him there. The barge didn't even lower its ramp until he was a few feet away. Nevertheless, he prepared himself for battle. All right, Prince Hothead, he growled, flexing his fingers, are you ready for round two? I'd call it round one. The hell. Naruto was expecting Zuko to step off that ship and face him. Not a girl. Certainly not someone his age. Sheesh, first Suki and those Kayashi warriors, and now this. Why did he seem to be facing the opposite sex as of late? Was fate messing with him or something? It must be. So he stood there and watched wary as this newcomer surveyed her surroundings. There was something dangerous about her. He cold and quite put his finger on it, perhaps it was her aura. Or maybe it was the eyes. In any case Yuzumaki Naruto, avatar of the gods, found himself just a touch uncomfortable. So, this is Kayashi Island. The girl murmured to herself as she disembarked. It seems father was right to plant that spy on Zuzu's ship after all. And now I've beaten him to the punch. How wonderful. She extended her slim shoulder in a shrug. Honestly, what more could a girl ask for? Suddenly wary, Naruto edged a foot forward. This girl wasn't like the others he'd fought. Erm um, you're not Zuko. The girl saw him and smiled then, it was a soft deadly dangerous thing, that smile. Well, 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 what do we have here? She chuckled. You mean to say you're the avatar that I've heard so much about? Her gaze roamed across his lightly armored body with intrigue, a spark of interest shining in those dark orbs of hers. You certainly are handsome, I'll give you that. But you should be humbled. A hand rose in a fierce flourish of blue flame. You have the honor of addressing Azula, Princess of the Fire Nation. I do hope you've prepared yourself. For? Why, for the fight of your life, of course. Azula said it as though it were the most obvious thing in the world. You didn't think I rushed here ahead of my brother just to have tea now, did you? Despite himself and all his power, Naruto actually blanched behind his guard. Ah, Christ. Then his vision swelled with azure fire. I never really figured out just why I enjoyed breaking and out of jail so much. Maybe it had something to do with my initial disrespect for authority. Perhaps my dislike of the Fire Nation. It might even have something all that time I spent trapped in that blood prison way back when. Who knows. Regardless, I was never really much of a fan of being locked up or seeing others be unjustly imprisoned. In any case, I all but jumped at the chance to do something for these people. They needed a hero. And we just so happened to be there. Plus, it was the perfect chance to unleash my ultimate prank. I'd been looking for a good excuse to cause some mischief anyway. But it just so happened to manifest in this time of need was nothing short of a blessing. 
We made our plans that night, the six of us ate if you count Appa and Momo and, I could see there was some skepticism at first. Why wouldn't there be? This plan essentially hinged on myself, Ong, and Haru. Were it to fall, we'd be down two avatars and an earthbender. Not exactly the most pleasing outcome. But I was confident in my plan, and in my friends. What could possibly go wrong? Su so here's the plan to invade the prison and kick some Fire Nation ass. Naruto began some time later. I'm only going to explain this once, so listen, and listen well. He gathered them all together in a nearby bar and the eight of them. Himself, Katara, Suki, Sokka, Ong, Appa, Momo and last, but certainly not least, Haru. Night was falling on the village tomorrow they would enact this gloriously devious strategy to free Haru's father and all the benders from Fire Nation Kano. Now, first, we scare the hell out of the little bitches. Naruto. The blonde sighed as Katara whacked him on the shoulder, the only part of him she could reach. Sorry, forgot about the swearing. Oh, leave him be, Katara. Suki paused from stroking Appa's chin to shake her head. He's obviously set on this. And it's not like we can leave those people trapped. Naruto opened his mouth to agree, that was when he saw the moonlight striking her face. She turned away from him, returning her attention to Appa, and for this, he was suddenly intensely grateful. It means she didn't catch him staring. She really did look different without her Kayashi warrior makeup. Like a normal girl, even. Although she'd yet to change out of her armor, he could still see that she was a true beauty and would only grow with age. Unbidden the memory of her kiss came roaring back, filling his face with fire. Down boy. Is there something on my face? The young warrior became aware of his attention and touched a hand to her cheek. Naruto nearly swooned before getting himself back under control. Just barely. He'd gone without the fairer sex for so long he'd almost forgotten what it was like. And was it just him, or did he feel a touch of killer intent from Katara? No no, he shook his head rapidly, dismissing Suki's words. It's nothing. Oh. She seemed slightly crestfallen at that. I see. I agree. Ong nodded, utterly oblivious to the scene or the tension. Sounds fun, right? Haru blinked. Fun. Don't listen to him. Sokka cried. This is not fun. This is the opposite of fun. Why aren't you listening, Ong? But I think it's fun. Darn it Naruto, you've doomed us all. In that instant, the shinobi shook off his sorrow and grinned, that smile could have put a certain spirit to shame. No, I've doomed the enemy. Suki gulped. Um, Naruto. Um. You're seriously starting to scare me right now. The blonde's grin only grew. Good. He chuckled. Then it'll terrify the Fire Nation. Now here's the plan. He told them as much, his glorious idea to rescue the prisoners and prank the hell out their Fire Nation's wardens. There was a silence then, more than a few jaws hung agape at what the blonde had just told them. If he hadn't been the avatar of the gods, such a thing wouldn't have been feasible. Even now, his strange Sugis Chong strained the limits of their credulity. Suki and Haru remained particularly baffled. Granted, they had not known the shinobi all that long, but this this was ridiculous. You sir, are a mad genius. Katara shook her head in disbelief, further inflaming their confusion. Disguising ourselves as Fire Nation. I'm surprised Sokka didn't think of that. Hey, I can't come up with all the plans. The warrior replied, begrudgingly recognizing the simple brilliance of Naruto's scheme. Guess I'm not the only tactician here. Aren't I? Naruto grinned, slapping his foster brother on the back. Honestly though, I think that title of mad genius should be reserved for Bumi. Ong burst into hysterics at that one. But how are you going to get on board without alerting them? I already told you, I'm not. Naruto's grin grew. Asla is. His gaze slid to Haru. She'll be escorting an atreasonous earthbender. Now it was Haru's turn to object. I haven't known you all that long, but this doesn't make any sense. How are we going to get the princess of the Fire Nation by the earth? Before he could finish, the blonde snorted and slapped both hands together, summoning up a massive plume of smoke, hence the exclamation. A series of hacking coughs arose from the barn, and when the plume dissipated Team Avatar found themselves treated to an inexplicable sight. Naruto was gone. Princess Azula stood in his place. Hello, Cretans. She sneered. Miss me. What in the? Their reaction time was nothing short of spectacular, Azula instantly found herself ensorcelled within a wall of earth and ice, with Sokka's boomerang and Suki's fan at her throat. Aang was the only one who held back, although whether it was out of hesitation or his own reluctance to kill, remained to be seen. What have you done with Naruto? Katara demanded to know. Where is he? What did you do to him? Where did you take him? Oh, places. The princess's smile never faltered in the face of the waterbender's fury, those eerie golden orbs drifting slightly shut. Things. You know. That sort of thing. Answer me. 
Why, he's right here of course, when next they opened, those eyes were a startling shade of blue Naruto's voice issuing forth from Azula's mouth a moment later. He, it's only me. Sorry about that, I couldn't resist pulling your legs. I just look like her, don't I? The simple shrug of those slender shoulders swiftly shattered the prison Katara and Haru had encased him in, shooting shards of dirt and broken earth, erupting outwards with effortless ease. By the time the dust had cleared, Naruto was with them once more. Wow. On blinked. Wish I could do that. Katara wasn't so easy to convince. Wait a second. How do we know you're the real Naruto? The long-suffering sigh left his lips. Alright then. Only I could know this. The waterbender stiffened. He wouldn't dare. Katara, when you were only six years old you once told me you wanted to marry someone. That someone was Naruto's mouth was quickly covered by a deeply flushing Katara. You promised not to talk about that, Naruto. She hissed out. Turning her head slightly she found Nai, but everyone staring back at her with confused expressions. Her flush grew even redder. Thankfully, Naruto chose that moment to break the silence. Oh and Sokka, you wet the bed until you were ten. Do you believe me now? The hysteria that followed as well as the grateful giggle from Katara was utterly priceless. Haru actually snickered. You did what? Not cool, man. Sayaka whined. Not cool. Naruto. Suki gawped, stepping forward. I'm afraid I don't understand. How did you turn into that girl? Um, yes. Haru agreed. Could you please explain, Sir Avatar? The blonde merely laughed and changed back into Azula again. Henge. The now transformed Naruto smiled softly as he observed a manicured hand. It was eerie, Suki thought. By the gods themselves, he even sounded like that crazy girl. It's a fascinating ability, to tell the truth, useful, too. I've had centuries to master its greatest intricacies, I can stay like this for at least a week if I don't use any of my major techniques. It used to be I could only transform into someone I knew, but now. Now I can become almost anyone. Of course I did think about becoming the royal flaming asshole himself, Fire Lord Oz I anyone. But where's the fun in that I say? Suki frowned. You think this is fun? Of course I do. Naruto grinned, hopping back into his normal body. It's been ages since I've pranked the Fire Nation. What better way to do it than with their own princess? I got a good look at her mannerisms when wefted, with a bit of practice, I'm certain I can fool them. From there, it's just a matter of pranking the hell out of the warden and his men, not to mention inspiring the earthbenders to rise up and fight their opposer as true warriors should. It'll be cake. It still doesn't change the fact that you're taking an awful risk. She pressed. You're one of our strongest fighters, remember? If we lose you, then we risk losing the war itself. She didn't see Ong bristle in the corner of her eye. For a moment Naruto thought the boy was going to reveal his status, a curt glare from Katara caused him to swiftly shut his mouth. That. Suki, don't worry. He tried to brush off her concern gingerly as he could. I'll be careful. Like you were careful against Azula. Came the retort. Naruto, she burned you. Her words caused him to cringe, he was well aware of the still healing scar lining his neck. He'd gained it when deflecting Azula's bolt of lightning, it had actually managed to char him a little before he'd grabbed and redirected it. The injury didn't impede him, but it still served as a brutal reminder of what might happen, should he ever hold himself back in the heat of battle like that again. That was the first and last time he'd underestimate a firebender. Or anyone, for that matter. That won't happen again. Agitated though he might be, Naruto refused to let it show. If you'd just hear me out. I'm sorry, I can't agree with this plan. It puts you in too much danger. Let me know when you've thought of something less dangerous. She walked away and out of the barn before anyone could think to stop her. The ensuing silence tasted like ash in Naruto's throat. Why was she so worried about him? Suki. She'll be back. Sokka yawned. What matters now is that we get some shut eye. Obviously, we've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. I'm going to bed. Naruto groaned as the others grabbed their bag and prepared to turn in, wisely refraining from saying anything. Everyone, save Katara. She alone approached him, realizing his distress, whereas the others did their best to avoid it, not for lack of caring, but out of fear for angering the powerful shinobi. Are you alright? She asked, touching a hand to his shoulder. Naruto feigned a shrug. Was it something I said? She just worries about you. Yeah, I gathered that much. Honestly, I erg. He would have said more, had not his injury flared up. Tongues of invisible fire shot up and down his neck, a silent reminder of the near miss he'd suffered back on Kiyashi Island. Katara saw him cringe and dipped a hand into the pouch she wore around her arm. Almost before he knew it he felt the cool touch of water upon his neck, stinging yes, but soothing the worst of the pain. It had not the healing properties of proper medicine not yet but he sensed she'd soon lean about her powerful talents. Till then, he'd just bear with a wound and let it heal. She really hurt you, didn't she? 
Katara soothed, running her still wet hand across the fresh scar, numbing it even further. Naruto bit back another sigh. Nothing I haven't endured before. Naruto I. Hmm. I think Suki might be right. She indicated a bale of hay and forced him to sit so she could tend the wound further. Your plan's rather reckless. Not you too. Naruto groaned childishly as she complied with her demand. Why is everyone so concerned about me? Have you all forgotten just how strong I am? It's not just me, Katara replied, running her hands over his neck. Everyone worries about you. The way you throw yourself into battle it's almost like you're suicidal. The former shinobi ruthlessly bit back the urge to snap at her for the unperceived slight. Death was the last thing he wanted, but he daren't tell her that. There you go. All done. Sking softly to himself, the last shinobi sat up, his treatment finished. Fine. He relented. Because you ask so nicely, I'll try to be more careful. Her smile was nothing short of dazzling. Oh and by the way, she leaned closer, if you ever mention that bit about me wanting to marry you when I was little. Yes. This time, the smile was so cold it actually made him shiver. I'll bury you in a glacier. With that, she strode away. Naruto watched her go, shaking his head. Why did he always attract deadly women? Why? Why couldn't his life just be simple? Later that night, his life became even more complicated. Naruto had chosen to take the first watch, on the off chance that the guard from before wanted to exact his vengeance on Hera's shop. They'd be in for a nasty surprise, that they would. Still it was a lonely duty, trying to stay awake, out here in the cold, all by himself. For a brief moment he imagined he was on his own again, with no friends or family to call his own. It made him shudder. Those thought of belling alone were no longer a passing fear, now it was a nightmare of sorts. He'd spent so much time in a group that the thought of leaving them behind actually hurt. That'll happen someday, he reminded himself, make no mistake. If this war didn't kill Katara and his newfound friends then old age certainly would. The vile old one enemy even he couldn't defeat. Time. Everything had been so much easier when he'd only need worry about himself. Now it seemed everywhere they went, their little group grew a little larger. First with Suki on Kiyashi. Now in this desolate little village, Haru. Ong just might have found a way to start learning earthbending in him, even if the young bender decided to remain behind once they went on their way, which remained quite likely. Who knew what would come to pass next? Once, that would have sorrowed him. Now he refused to look to the future. He'd long since resolved to live in the moment since joining the Southern Water Tribe, trying to gaze ahead into his future would only bring upon him untold sorrow. His strange little family was only growing. That should make him happy. Right, he pinched his whiskered cheeks, happy. His thoughts were broken by the crack of a broken branch somewhere behind him, alert. He rounded with a hiss and stepped toward the darkness Rinnegan flaring. Who goes there? Relax. A familiar voice soothed. It's me. Suki. Naruto relaxed a touch, baffled to find none other than Suki emerging from the black at his flank. Don't do that. I could have killed you. She looked fearsome in her armor, but somehow the lack of makeup made her appear almost fragile, he thought. Sorry, the Kayashi warrior smiled softly, at least she had the good grace to look sheepish. I couldn't sleep. You too, huh? The brunette nodded in affirmation, coming to stand beside him. I thought I'd come to relieve you. Naruto shook his head. Not tired. The words lapsed into awkward silence. Neither dared glance at one another, painfully aware of the argument they'd had mere hours before. At last, Naruto couldn't take it anymore. He'd been so caught up in his plan for prankdom that he'd failed to notice the lone voice of dissent in the group. Was it right for him to just dismiss her out of turn like that? Of course not. He needed to pause and consider the other's thoughts, not throw himself headlong into battle and cause chaos without a care. He opened his mouth to speak, and so too did she. I'm sorry I'm sorry. They apologized in the same instant. There was a brief moment of hesitation, then the two teens laughed, the tension bursting forth from them in a single guffaw. Just like that it was over, the rift between them was closed. It was wrong of me to call you foolish. Tsuki admitted. And it was wrong of me to be so reckless. Naruto replied. Tsuo I guess we're good, then. Best so. Darn, she swore, her pale face flushing beneath the moonlight. I feel like a complete idiot. At his questing look, she continued. Here I had this grand speech prepared, and then you forgive me, just like that. What am I supposed to do now? You could always stay and watch the stars with me. Naruto drawled, gazing upward at the thousands of tiny pinpricks above, the raiment of heaven hanging over their heads. I was keeping watch for that firebender from before, but I think he's given up for the day. He sat and patted the spot beside him, quietly wondering whether or not she would accept the unspoken invitation. I'd like that. Naruto felt his heart skip a beat as the young warrior accepted his offer, sitting down and scooting dangerously close to him. When her hand came to rest atop his he nearly jumped out of his skin. 
but Suki was flushing just as much as he, so he bore with it. That's the star of Kiyashi. She indicated a particularly bright pinprick of light with her finger. You can see it from almost anywhere in the world. Burrito whistled. I had no idea you were well versed in astrology. It's nice, isn't it? She murmured, laying her head on his shoulder, still peering up at the stars. I could just stare at them all night. Burrito made no move to pull away. If Suki was interested in him, then so be it. He was beginning to understand now, see the futility of it all. Nothing he said to her would change her mind short of outright violence, and right now he just didn't have the heart to push her away. A sudden pang of guilt stabbed at this heart as they stood there beneath the stars. This girl trusted him, looked out for him, wanted the best for his sake, and here he was all but lying to a fellow member of Team Avatar, someone whom he just might be developing feelings for. Suki there's something I need to tell you. Yes. I'm not the Avatar. He blurted out. There was another silence, this one charged with awkward tension. Suki pulled away from Naruto, her auburn eyes boring deep into his own. When she finally spoke, her voice was the barest of whispers. I know. You knew. Naruto's jaw nearly hit the ground. What? When? For a few weeks now. She admitted, suddenly sheepish. I realized around the time when we left Kiyashi, it was always Ong who kept focusing on saving the world. Not you. When I saw the marking and his bending it kinda became obvious. When I asked Sokka and Katara, they fessed up that it was their idea. At the blonde's pensive expression, she offered up a slight smile. I'm not angry you know. I understand why you lied to me back then. You might not be the avatar everyone was looking for, but you were just doing what you felt right, I suppose. Well, that's just it. A wry smile pulled at his lips, it felt good to open up, especially to her. I suppose you could say I am an avatar, but not like Ong. My abilities don't focus primarily on the elements, but other areas of that aspect. They make me almost invincible, but I can still be injured. Here he touched hand to his scar. Still be killed. That was why I spoke out earlier. When those words came, they nearly floored him, but it was nothing compared to what came next. We still need you. I need you. She said the last part in a very tiny voice. Were an ordinary man present, he wouldn't have heard it. But Naruto was no ordinary man. He heard every word. Why? The warrior blinked slowly. Why what? Why would you need someone like me? Because you're you. Suki replied. Even with all your imperfection. You might be stubborn, headstrong, reckless. Naruto coughed. Ahem, sitting right here. Oh oh, sorry. Suki flushed. Anyway. You inspired me. She continued, her voice gaining force with each word. Until the day we met, I thought Kayashi was all that mattered. There was nothing else. No one else. I didn't care about the Fire Nation or about the war heck, I'd been convinced the Avatar didn't exist until you and Ong showed up. But you proved me wrong. I decided to leave Kayashi because of you. It doesn't matter whether you're the Avatar or not. You still showed me I have much to learn, reminded me that there's an entire world out there for me to see. A world that will be destroyed by the Fire Nation if something isn't done. Her words were so impassioned by the time she finished, Naruto was literally left in awe. I'm glad I could inspire you. Tsuo, back on Kiyashi. What you saw were shinobi skills, Suki. I gained them a lifetime ago. Darn. She pouted. And here I was hoping you could teach me. A slight smile played on her pale features. It might not be real bending, but I'd love to learn. Naruto actually blinked at that. He'd never once considered taking on a student in this land. He was the last of a great people and would likely still reincarnate time and time again. But to restart the shinobi people as a whole why hadn't he thought of this sooner? Was this what he was meant to do? Recreate his people? He wasn't sure. I suppose I could try. Really? I don't see why not. Naruto shrugged. But I should warn you. I'm a strict teacher. I. His words died away as her lips touched touched his cheek for the second time since they'd met. Wah? I look forward to learning from you then, Sifu Naruto. She rose and performed a deep bow. And I'll see you later. Good night. What was it that drew strong, deadly girls to him? Katara hadn't struck him as dangerous until this evening, her threat about burying him had been quite real. Suki was a warrior herself, now aspiring to be a shinobi in a world of benders and non-benders. Then there had been that Hellcat from the Fire Nation. Azula. That was one Hulu the fighter, there. Idly, he wondered. What was Princess Hothead up to now? Meanwhile. You should be afraid of me. Azula jumped to a siding position in her cot on the ship with a small scream, her eyes popping open wide, sweat on her forehead, and her breath coming in small shallow gasps. A dream, she realized, willing her frantic heart to stop beating its way out of her chest. It had been just a dream. Nothing more and nothing less. The princess tried to tell to the adrenaline coursing through her veins quietly willing her body to accept what her mind already knew to be true. It was all a dream. 
She told herself that repeatedly as she tried to settle back down on the cot. It was all a dream. She tried to stare at the still lit candles of her cabin until she fell asleep, but they cast shadows and played havoc with her mind, she was literally jumping at the sight of them. Closing her eyes didn't help either, she was terrified he would come for her in the dark. Terrified, and yet. Strangely excited. The longer she lay there, the more that excitement began to exert itself, the thrill of facing a strong opponent warring with the terror of being made a helpless little girl before him. Just a dream, she reminded herself. Just a dream, just a dream, just a dream. But if it was a dream, why did it hurt? Sleep gummed eyes creaked open once more and surveyed her cabin, barely able to comprehend her dimming surroundings. Wait a minute. She bolted upright again, memories blazing through her mind like an inferno of authorwardly fire. The avatar. He killed her. Hadn't he? She clearly recalled tasting blood in her mouth, feeling her spirit depart her body. And yet here she was, as though she'd woken up from a horrible dream. But it was no dream. It had been real. All too real. Why am I not dead? She thought, checking herself for injuries. Thankfully, she found some. Thankfully because it meant she wasn't losing her mind. That twinge in her right side bespoke of a recently healed broken rib and the dull pulse of her ankle, warned that her left ankle was still very much sprained. Her cheek was horribly sore, there would be a bruise tomorrow morning if she was lucky swelling if she wasn't. Apparently only the most life-threatening injuries had been tended to. Her wounds were still healing, but they looked as though they'd been tended to. Recently. Perhaps only a few days ago. She knew none of her men were capable in the healing arts, most of them barely knew how to try and bandage their own. That left the avatar. Naruto. He must have done this. But why? Why kill her and bring her back? It was well known that the avatar had power over the spirit world, but she hadn't thought that a being like that could bring the dead back. Bring her back. Dry as she might she just couldn't muster up the rage she needed to hate him. Terror at what he'd done to her, yes, and excitement at the prospect of fighting him again, but anger. No. It simply wouldn't come. What has he done to me? She touched a hand to her head, the room still swimming in the candlelight. Why, she whispered to herself, tucking her knees into her chest. Why did you do that, you fool? Her last words were little more than a soft, lonely whisper. Why did you heal me? The next morning. They took Haru's mother. Naruto bolted upright, lurching out of his sleeping bag as Sokka's cry filled the barn. Rather, he tried. Something warm and soft, though no necessarily heavy, pushed him back down. It took him less than an instant to recognize that familiar bob of brown hair in his peripherals. Suki. Somehow, she'd crawled into his sleeping bag overnight. How on earth never mind. He was a shinobi, for the love of those gods. Honestly, after that kiss last night, he should have expected something like this. Kakashi sensei's words rang in his mind from ages past. Look underneath the underneath. Thankfully no one noticed in the chaos, everyone was too busy darting outside to investigate the burns outside. Haru in particular. Naruto was suddenly and intensely grateful that he'd hidden the boy further back in the barn, rather than risk him being discovered. But now was not the time for such things. In that time it took for everyone to scramble out, Naruto managed to jostle Suki awake, and after a bit of flushing on both of their parts, they were able to squirm free without anyone being the wiser. We speak of this to no one. Suki nodded fervently. Agreed. They emerged to find the shop scorched beyond all recognition, the ground blackened and twisted, for at least a mile around. Talk about your scorched earth responses. Evidently, the firebenders hadn't taken too kindly to Naruto's little prank. Eru was visibly trembling with anger, tiny pebbles stirring at his feet, whilst he struggled to control his anger, prevent himself from erupting into a terrifying display of earthbending prowess. But the leash on his bending was thin, and the poor boy looked as though he might snap at any instant if someone didn't say something. Eru. Naruto barked. Front and center. The boy went stiff as a rod. Yes, Avatar Naruto. Naruto silently resolved to tell the boy the truth later. But for now, he needed to take command, or the poor kid was going to kill someone. We're getting your mother back. In fact, we'll be bringing all the earthbenders back he declared. Right here. Right now. But the plan. Is about to be improvised. Naruto replied sternly, beckoning them closer. Come here. All of you. I'll have to henge the lot of you for this to work. Wow. Ong glanced down at his illusory body in utter awe, barely able to believe what his fellow avatar had done to the six of them. They all looked like firebenders. Right down to the armor. Haru and Suki remained stokely silent, the latter deciding not to wonder just how Naruto had Sokka, and Katara appeared to be visibly chafing at their new albeit temporary appearance. Appa and Momo had been left behind in the barn, changing their appearance wouldn't do anything but hinder the group, and no one would believe a firebender with a sky bison. It won't last. A slightly winded Naruto explained. I can only maintain those forms for an hour or so. Guess we'll have to make this quick. 
And to think, I was so looking forward to using the rotten eggs and glue I'd sealed away. Ah well. I can always make it better. Drawing himself up, he transformed into Azula, assuming the role with an eerie level of grace. Now remember, he began, you'll need follow my lead. No talking. No showboating. You're supposed to be my elite guard for this little venture. Nothing more. Do not speak unless spoken to. Once we get aboard, get out of sight and drop the transformations. The rest is up to you. With the plan in place, he led them to the nearest garrison, kicked down the door, and barged in. You there. Soldier. The Fire Nation lieutenant had just opened his mouth to reply, only for his jaw to slam into the ground once he laid eyes upon Azula striding toward him. Princess Azula. I take it you know who I am? Yes, Mladdy. He swiftly fell to a knee in genuflection. Your father did not inform us of your arrival. We weren't expecting you. Had you sent word, I would have prepared a proper welcome. No need. Naruto silenced him with a wave. I am here of my own accord. Now, what is your name? Lieutenant Shu, my lady. The man barely stammered out. If I may ask, to what do we owe the honor? Consider this a surprise inspection, Lieutenant Shu. The smile Naruto generated was entirely genuine, hand you're not. I'm touring the colonies, making certain everything is up to par as per my father's standards. I understand you have an offshore prism responsible for manufacturing coal, do you not? At the man's nod, the pseudo-princess continued. As I thought. Take me to this so-called prison of yours, soldier. I wish to see it for myself. Personally. Would your guards be accompanying us as well, my lady? Yes, of course we will. Naruto waved off the man's concern with the royal we he'd heard by so many arrogant nobles in his land. Another touch of Genjutsu was all it took to bend the man's mind to his will, to prevent him from questioning the strange behavior of these so-called guards. Of course, princess. I now know why I enjoy breaking in and out of prisons. It isn't the food. Nor the guards. And it certainly isn't the people. Not the slate gray walls or the lumpy beds either. It is something far more base than that, a vile little word that I have come to love. Pranking. Barring that, there is one other word. That word would best be described as. Right. Naruto as Azula was laughing his head off as he flung fireballs at the hapless Fire Nation guards. Ong's trick had worked flawlessly, summoning up coal from the vents. A few impassioned words from Katara toward the earthbenders, and that was their cue for Azula to lose her pretty little head and join the resistance. Their transformations dropped away in hiding, Katara and the others were thus freed to leap into action and wreak all manner of havoc upon the warden and his men in spectacular fashion. In short, all bloody hell broke loose. I do so love it when a plan comes together. For the next hour, the entire Fire Nation prison experienced pure hell. But, that was not Naruto's intention. No, this had been done for one reason and one reason only. Impersonating a Fire Nation princess was certainly a pricey little move, but making everyone think said princess was on the side of the enemy was utterly priceless. In short, Azula's feared reputation of being the Fire Nation's best was brought crumbling down around her unknowing ears in a matter of minutes. Now, when the Fire Nation spoke of their beloved princess, they would speak of only one thing. Azula had gone mad. Bandished Azula could barely believe her ears when she received word by messenger Hawk two days later me. By father what do you mean? What did I do? When the bird simply sat there, she turned it into all but a roast chicken and demanded her cook serve it up for dinner. No, she whispered fervently, suffering a mental and comical breakdown. I can't be banished. Not me. I'm not like Zuzu, I'm father's favorite. There's no way I could be banished. There's just no way. Somewhere miles away. Uzumaki Naruto was laughing his ass off. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.